Hey, man. What's up? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. I was swallowing at the same time I was talking. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, have you ever heard of prohibition? Oh, yes. <laughs> nice. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, we're going to do. We're going to talk about alcohol today. Yeah, <laughs> buckle up and get your cards ready because you got to be 21 or over <laughs> to listen to this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm excited for this. This is going to be a long journey. Uh, okay. I don't know if it's going to be a long episode, but it's going to be a long journey. We're going to have to cover a lot. So buckle up, Buttercup. We're going to start all <laughs> the way in the 19th century. We're going pretty far into the past. Go they all us. look like the most unkissable women, too. <laughs> like, they all look like... I'm going to see her in my dreams, dude. What the frick? And the dad walks down the aisle with the taser. Just Here carrying comes the, the taste. Here and comes like the taste. <laughs> Things I learned last night. Picture this. It's about speaking of like 19th century is like the 1800s. 1800s. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Speaking of the 1800s. Okay. We're going there. Oh, to the 1800s. Yeah, we, we are. Learned dive travel. We're baby. going to Sword Dollar City. <laughs> yeah, on May 18th. May 18th for another and live. And live. Till and live in the park. At Silver Dollar City. At Silver Dollar City. And here's what's cool about it. Get your time machine. Get your time Get your machine. Your tickets will be available soon. And yeah. And we don't want to give away a lot we, yet. Yeah, we, we don't want to reveal too much. It's going to be legit. We're going to wear overalls. <laughs> well, he's going to be wearing overalls <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> okay. The traditional way. <laughs> <laughs> so prohibition <laughs> prohibition starts long before prohibition and about okay. 1850 um, prohibition is uh, like the 1920s, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're taking the story back to the 1850s. Right. Uh, America was a country. Uh, that was found right when it was founded. Loved alcohol. Okay. Um, there's stories going back to George Washington himself, um, and him and his cabinet members and soldiers, uh, just drinking on the job all the time. Um, super just blasted. And that was kind of the culture of society. People drank while they work, worked. People drank throughout the day. It, everybody was constantly drinking. Um, and it was, was not, alcohol as strong as it is now though. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I okay. do know that people were generally in a week's time uh, consuming three times the alcohol that the general population consumes in a week's time today. Um, okay. So people were drinking a lot and and it was pretty normal. It, so there's was, there was two very interesting things about drinking in the 1800s or really pre the prohibition. Um, and the two interesting things were one, uh, day drinking, drinking on the job was pretty normal. It was accepted. And it wasn't strange. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't something that you just, it wasn't taboo at all, right? Everybody did it when you were a child and you heard drinking and driving. Yes. Did you think that that meant just any drinks? Yeah. Any drink, yeah. So when my mom was had her diet Coke. Yes. I, yeah. I was like, you're drinking and driving. You're breaking the you're law. You're going to kill us. Yeah, we're going to die. I watched a video about this in the dare program. Yeah, and they said the dare program really was them trying to scare us straight. Yes. Wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, that was a lot of the 90s. Honestly, they had the dare program for yeah. alcohol and drugs. They had stranger danger for just other people um, other. Yeah, <laughs> anybody else is dangerous. Uh, they had a few. They had a few of those sorts of things where they just try to scare us out of Barney pretty much was a scare tactic. Um, Barney was a scare tactic. Yeah, go back and watch those episodes. Most of those episodes are trying to scare you out of doing something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, it's, it's going to be I'm going to be honest. It's been a while since I watched, but that's how I remember it. They're just trying to scare me out of doing stuff. <laughs> Church was the same way. They had the felt, the felt things, and now uh-huh. the felt shows were it's pretty scary. They were just trying to scare you out of doing stuff. All right, <laughs> the nineties were a scare tactic era. Um, anyways, uh, so it in the eighteen eighteen fifties. Oh, oh, so you drank? They they drank, drank right. on the job, but also drinking was a man's activity. So the man would leave the home and they would go to the bar and, and drink. It would just be guys and they would be hanging out. And they'd be drinking. Women were not a part of it. And so okay. women were separate from the drinking thing. That was not something like you never. It was very culturally looked down upon to drink in mixed company. You oh. only drank with your spouse. Me, with 
not even with your spouse, with members of your own sex. That was the only people you drank with. Um, and so men would go drink on the job and then afterwards they would go to the saloon and they would drink there, but they would never drink around the opposite. That's what I was most mad at when my mom would drink a Diet Coke. <laughs> I was like, not around me, woman. <laughs> I can't stand to watch you do that. <laughs> um, and it was something that um, honestly throughout the 19th century, most women um, and most wives yeah. uh, hate it. Uh, they did not like having drunk husbands uh, and they also yeah, unlike now <laughs> they love that now <laughs> and they did not like having absentee husbands because they would go work. They all day. love that now. That's what I'm saying. What do you mean? Was, <laughs> you're talking like that's new. Well, this was this was a growing trend like okay, um, and this was also happening during kind of like the birth of the women's rights movements. Sure, and so women were starting to kind of develop a voice for themselves for the first time in history really um, and uh, we saw the the birth of the women's uh, temperance movement, which was temperance was a movement to be like, hey, you should stop drinking so much alcohol um, and a union was put together um, that it was formalized in 1874 called called the Women's Christian Temperance Union and this organization was really put together to just protest drinking and the women would get together. They would go protest and that alone terrified at the public. They were like, look at all these women protesting, <laughs> like taking part in some sort of political action protesting or just gossiping. No, they were protesting. They would go out and they would pick it. Ours. Oh. Um, I thought you were saying they got together. No, they would actually like, we protest. Should tell them to quit drinking. Yeah, they would pick at bars, but they also would protest. They like these. These were very peaceful protests, and I say that on purpose uh, because they would go. They would sing hymns outside of bars, and they would kneel, and they'd all get together, and they'd be praying right outside the bar door, the saloon, the saloon door. Harsh in the vibes. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> 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 All these men super drunk. Here I am just trying to let loose from my hard day in the field. Yes. And I look out there and there's some nuns and they're hemming. <laughs> I, how am I supposed to knock back a couple cold ones? Well, I have to listen to all this prayer. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and uh it was not received well, right? Um, there was a lot of like uh, interactions with the crowds. Men were coming out and booing them and yelling at them and stuff like that. Um, in one case, the fire department came and sprayed them down with the fire hoses. Oh, geez. Um, and another case, a owner of a beer garden came out with a tank or not a tank a cannon <laughs> <laughs> leveled the whole town. Yeah, they were like, what is that? <laughs> no, he came out with a cannon, the equivalent of a tank in that time and threatened to shoot them if they didn't leave with a can. Why is the beer garden guy got a cannon? <laughs> That's a good question. He served in the war. He got it. <laughs> um, and so this is from my time in the Civil <laughs> War. <laughs> Probably yeah, That's what I'm saying. I, I kept it. I just took it with me when I when I finished um, and it became uh, it became a really rampant uh, thing across the nation. There was these women that were a part of the women's Christian temperance union protesting bars and 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 things like that. Sure. The most famous by far is a woman by the name of Carrie nation and she is my hero because Carrie, Carrie nation, nation. Yeah, Carrie nation, which first of all sounds like a Christian name. radio station. <laughs> hey, you're listening to Carrie you're listening to nation. Carrie nation. <laughs> uh, Carrie, Carry your burdens. <laughs> Carrie, uh, she was one of the women's temperance union people. Okay. So she would go protest uh, with a group of women uh, holding signs like this. This is a pretty popular Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and so she would go. They protest. all look like the most unkissable women too. <laughs> <laughs> they all look like you know the Wizard of Oz when she goes into that trailer and sees oh that lady gosh. who's like or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what every woman in this picture looks like. Yeah, that checks out. That does check out. Um, and Carrie Nation <laughs> was a part of the union, <laughs> and she uh, she was very very passionate about this this organization. Okay, and she would travel around. She was based in Kansas, but she would travel around the country doing these um, campaigns. And she was a part of a very large effort um, to actually like ban 
the sale of liquor in Kansas. And so she was a, a part of this campaign and it didn't quite go the way that she hoped it would. Um, and so uh, on June 5th, 1900, uh, she awoke in the middle of the night and she felt she received um, a vision from the Lord. Okay. And here's how she describes it. She says she awakened by a voice that seemed to be speaking in my heart and the words said, go to Kiowa, which is a town in Kansas. And he said, it is and, finished. And she said, <laughs> and my hands were lifted high and thrown down. And I heard the words, I'll stand by you. And so she claimed that what well, the way she interpreted this was obviously go to Kiowa. Was he wearing a hat? <laughs> She did take a lot of Benadryl. She too. She saw the hat man. <laughs> the hat man said, "Go to Kiowa, <laughs> and I'll be with you every night <laughs> for the rest of your I'll life." Be with you. <laughs> um, she interpreted how? So she interpreted that the way her hands were lifted up and thrown back down was the, her words: "Smash, smash, smash." <laughs> <laughs> so she went to Kiowa, and she found a saloon in Kiowa. And she picked up a bunch of rocks and she destroyed the place. She just started throwing rocks through the windows, rocks. throwing rocks through windows, throwing rocks at all the liquor bottles, throwing rocks into like all their like uh, their barrels, like contaminating their barrels and like breaking chairs, like just wrecking, like literally just tore this place to shreds. Um, it, she went to jail for this. Sure. Um, served a short sentence and then um, went home after this happened. And her <laughs> husband said, where were you at? <laughs> uh, Where have you been? Her husband, who she later divorced, but this husband, she said in an interview later, uh, gave said the best thing he ever said to her in her entire marriage. And he said, you know, it would have been a lot easier if you used an axe. So then Carrie Nation became <laughs> the axe smasher. <laughs> For those listening, <laughs> it's a black and white photo of an older woman. She's old, mm -hmm. holding a Bible in one hand and an axe in the other. But it's like a tomahawk. It's more like a tomahawk. Yeah, and yeah. she's wearing gloves. She's wearing leather gloves and small little glasses. <clears throat> and she's, <laughs> I mean, and so she starts. Going, I'm going to see her in my dreams, dude. What the frick? <laughs> she starts going from town to town to town. Okay. Smashing bars and saloons with her axe and breaking apart their barrels. Is that a picture of her? This is a picture of her smashing the barrels outside of a saloon and wrecking the place. And eventually she forms a posse that travels with her and they roll into saloons and bars just vandalizing and they vandalize the heck out of it. They dump out all their liquor. They smash everything. They break it to shreds uh, completely sober, <laughs> completely sober. <laughs> They're Carrie like, Nation. we're here to ruin your fun. She is my hero. Um, and it became it became a uh, a very popular thing in wow. local bars to have this sign somewhere in the barn uh, that says <laughs> <laughs> all nations are welcome except Carrie and a couple tomahawks on it. <laughs> That's a great shirt right there. <laughs> it is actually really sick um, because yeah, she just went from bar to bar smashing everything in the bar. Um, and so this movement starts really picking up some. But That's like you've seen the sign at a couple bars around Kansas City, right? Let's say everyone's welcome. And then underneath it, it says except Josh Hawley. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> pretty funny. Um, so prohibition uh, or prohibition hasn't started yet. This is the early 1900s. You got the women's temperance movement is getting really big. Sure. And they're really campaigning to get rid of alcohol. They don't want it anywhere in the world, uh, especially around them. And uh, you've got a larger group that is kind of taking to borderline violence. Well, I guess you can call this violence. It's violence against property. Yeah. Um, and they're destroying a lot of things. Um, and it's uh, how do we? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, it's it's something where there is a uh, uh, this large group of people who are opposed to it, and it's mostly like. Um, fundamentalist Christians right that are opposed to it, but the rest of the population is like prohibition is never going to happen. Sure. Like, come on, um, smash as much as you want, hold up as many signs as you want. We're still going to drink, okay? Until there was a guy by the name of Wayne Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Wayne Wheeler. Ha ha. Okay. Sorry. Wayne Wheeler. <laughs> Here, let me get you a picture of Wayne Wheeler so you can picture. Sure. Picture so I can picture him. <laughs> it's a picture of Wayne Wheeler. He Wayne, looks like a nerd. Wayne was he a, looks like a weeb. Wayne, <laughs> Wayne was a fundamentalist Christian uh-huh. um, and he knew hey what we're doing right now to try to make prohibition happen. Never going to work. Never going to make prohibition happen and he said we got to get into their heads and what we're doing. He's like he's like we're getting into their hearts and angering them and making them drink some more. We got to get into we got to turn this into a culture war. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so what he did is he started campaigning uh, a little differently and so okay. he would go um, and he would put together these rallies in towns and he um, he would get a group of fundamentalist Christians together and mm-hmm. he would say all the fundamentalist Christian talking points. He'd be like, yeah, the liquor is destroying our families. It's evil. It's sinful. We should not be a part of it. Like everything about it. It's ruining our society around fundamentalist Christians. Then he would go to a gr- groups of immigrants and he would say, hey, the alcohol is making it harder for you to assimilate into society and it's you're having a harder time finding jobs. It's ruining your career. It's making it impossible for you to actually get the step up that you came here for and then he would go to groups of alcoholics <laughs> and he would say, hey, the immigrants are coming in here and they're sober and they're beating and you they're out for your jobs. your jobs. Yeah, they're taking your jobs because they're not drunk like you. Next thing you know, you're going to lose your jobs and you're going to be on the streets because you can't keep up with the sober minded immigrants that are stealing your jobs and so he was coming to all these different groups with different stories that he was threading together okay. to make them think alcohol was the big bad bad guy. <laughs> and it was a different story in everything he would do and oftentimes be contradictory stories, but it worked. worked. Right. There was these big groups that were starting to form of people who were like, you know what? He's right. Like this stuff is is ruining my opportunity at jobs. It is causing crime in our cities. It is doing whatever the big enemy was in that group. He made alcohol the source, the root of whatever that big enemy was for that group. Sure. And campaigned for it that way. Um, And his movement began to grow and somehow no one ever put together the fact that this guy was just lying to them the whole time. They believed him wherever he went. Uh, So he's just doing anti alcohol propaganda. Essentially, uh, essentially he's just lying. Yeah, yeah. He's just lying to the public and letting them hear whatever they want to hear. Sure. But spinning it against alcohol, no matter what the thing is. Well, I mean, like that's what isn't that what fitness influencers are doing right now, too? They go, listen, if you drink a single beer, you're gonna lose <laughs> you're gonna end up just like a fat lard. It's kind of, yeah, honestly. It's pretty similar. Uh, and so he was able to spin this and in nineteen twenty, the prohibition thing had come on the ballot for years and then okay. I'd actually been starting to pass throughout a, a lot of different um, countries and so a combination of the really? women's temperance unit. Yeah, there, I think I think America was like the 10th country to do it. It happened in Canada. Uh, it happened in Russia, Iceland, Soviet Union, Finland, Norway. Oh, sorry, Norwegia, Denmark. Like it happened in a lot of countries before us. Um, so we were late to the game. Um, but a combination of the women's temperance unit the uh, Wayne Wheeler and then a big part of this was World War One World War One happens and the big bad 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 and he guys, goes this wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for alcohol <laughs> if it wasn't for well what actually happened what he didn't really have a part of this campaign this the, the ground was laid there the groundwork sure. was there everybody was there was there was these murmurs people, people were being like, like maybe alcohol is Wayne bad. Wheeler the first it was like W W one coincidence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're gonna start a world war to get people to quit drinking, <laughs> I mean, kudos to you. No, uh, the uh, the, I mean, that's the why they're groundwork was it there. It was, it was like cigarettes in 2000. It was like it was like most of the world was like, yeah, that's probably not good. But there's still a good chunk of people that but were still, still doing every it. restaurant you go to asks yeah. if there's a smoking or a non-smoking section. Yeah, pretty much everyone knew. Probably not a good thing. It's kind of like now why? Kind of like social media. There right really now. was no non-smoking section when you think about it. When you go back <laughs> in that time, it just because yeah, it wafted through. Because you can just <laughs> it doesn't smell it. Yeah, it doesn't go away. It's just a little less. Also, why? <laughs> Who's not able to sit through a meal? What do you mean? 
Are you like... Oh, and not be able to smoke? I think so. Why are you eating? So. I think so, yeah. Because it was... I mean, there was a time where it was ubiquitous. Like, it was... You just did it all the time. <laughs> and so, I, I, I do guess. think there was some people who would, like, during their meal... Do you think that we'll get to... I do... Th- I say this all the time, actually. I think we'll get to a spot in, like, a couple decades where we talk about social media the way we talk about smoking cigarettes now. Yeah, I think smoking cigarettes like in you, 2000 did that. It's like social media right now. I do think that that that's the scenario because we all recognize probably not good for us. This is probably not a definitely great not good for the youths, um, but we're all still just like eh, it's yeah, fine still doing it. We can still do it on planes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. If you like it, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, Speaking of future episodes, we have a ton of past episodes. Uh, We have a back catalog of well over 100 episodes. Uh, So check those out. My current favorite is Nellie Bly. She was a journalist from the early 1900s who totally changed the industry, especially for women in the industry. Super cool story, but also kind of crazy. Uh, some of the things that she did. Uh, we had a lot of fun in that episode. So check that out. Uh, don't for, forget to subscribe, but ultimately just thanks for being here. Yeah, and so that's kind of where it was with alcohol. Everybody okay. was kind of like, ah, oh, we probably shouldn't be doing this, but like we still are, you know, was kind of where it was at. Yeah. The opinion was starting to sway, but World War One happens and the new big bad, bad, bad guys, uh, Germany were big into beer. Um, I thought they were the who's the bad guys in World War One? Germany. No. Yes. Yes. Germany was the big bad bad. I guess I don't remember World War, World War One. Yeah. They had a there was a group of them that were involved in it, but Germany was the the head. And then they World War One ends twice. World War One ends. They kind of reestablish, and then Hitler comes back, and Hitler kind of does what another big bad bad guy that starts with the letter P is doing now, where he's like, remember the glory days. Um, yeah, and then everybody else in the world was like, "You are really bad." And Why did you say he starts with a P? As if it was like <laughs> another guy who starts with a P. As if Hitler starts with a P. <laughs> Fitler. It's silent. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> no, uh, but the big bad bad guys, Germany. Okay, um, they were the, war, war, they war. were so bad uh, sure. to the public that everything German you could not have a part of and and they were uh, changing German things. So for example, sauerkraut became I think it was like Liberty Liberty sauce or something like that. Like they were Liberty sauce. (laughs) You're saying they freedom fries. Yeah, they did. They changed everything and um, sauerkraut just became hot dog lettuce. (laughs) Hot dog lettuce. Yeah, would you like some hot dog lettuce with that? (laughs) <laughs> and a lot, but a lot of German customs started to be seen as taboo. Okay. And this was kind of the nail in the coffin because they're like, Germans are drunks. We need to differentiate Germans ourselves. Are drunks. <laughs> we need to differentiate Obviously, ourselves. Obviously, that's what the only thing they're known for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll take that reputation now. <laughs> I'm sure now they're like, please remember please us. As just that. remember us as just drunks. Don't bring up anything else. All we are is drunk. <laughs> ah, yeah. They're like Germans are drunks. We don't want to be anything like them. And right. so, um, that was kind of the final nail in the coffin that led a lot of, especially in Europe, those European countries that were like most impacted by World War One, um, started passing the prohibition laws. And in 1920, U.S. passed theirs. And this was an interesting thing. Um, Prohibition was a very strange era in America um, because from 1920 to 1933, so 13 years, alcohol consumption or the sale of alcohol was illegal. The consumption of alcohol was legal, but if you can get it, yeah, getting it was really hard. Um, What we saw happen pretty so really they just made it so that only the rich could partake. Well, kind of a lot of the rich before because there was like a deadline. It was kind of like the purge. Everybody knew it was coming. Up. Yeah, and everybody stocked up on their alcohol. So a lot of rich people did stock up on alcohol before um before like it passed. Because a lot of people were like, Yeah, this isn't gonna last. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody expected this to last 13 years. Um but uh when it passed, what it meant was you couldn't sell it and you couldn't have like a bar or a saloon or anything like that. So all those got shut down. Um <laughs> liquor stores got shut down. 
Uh, Applebee's like- almost didn't make it through. <laughs> yeah, Applebee's cannot be profitable without their dollar margaritas. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, you're not going there for the food. Let's be real. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, so they, uh, uh, what was interesting though is there was a couple clauses that made this work. Okay. Uh, well, that people I should there say were made two this clauses. <laughs> there was a couple. Mr. Cla- and Mrs. <laughs> there was a couple clauses that were like exploited. Is maybe a better way to say this. Okay. So um, you were allowed to sell alcohol to clergy because of communion. Um, and for like religious rights. Okay. So all of a sudden, a lot of, a lot of people became clergymen. Like, oh, yeah, I'm a priest. <laughs> I'm a priest. <laughs> so they could buy wine. <laughs> or <laughs> I can't sell this to you. <laughs> Our father <laughs> says, You may. <laughs> he came to me in a dream. <laughs> And he, and said, he said, smash, smash, smash. smash. <laughs> so, so I guess that's what we're going to have to do. If you don't sell it to me, <laughs> I'm going to smash, smash. smash. <laughs> uh, so, so there's groups of people who are getting around it by becoming clergymen. There was another thing where alcohol, as long as it wasn't alcohol, you could sell it. So there was these things. <laughs> okay. There's these things known as wine blocks, um, which were blocks of wine, but it wasn't fermented yet. And so it was literally like a cube of every like dehydrated grape juice, I guess. And they were like, yeah, this is just a block. If you put it in your cabinet for a couple of days, don't do that because then it's going to ferment and then you could melt it and then it's wine. But we don't think you should do that. But you should Is buy it this. Frozen? I don't know if it's frozen. I don't know exactly how they blocked it. I don't know how they cubed it. But okay. it was a cube of basically not yet fermented wine. And they're like, you just store it in your cabinet for like a week or two and it'll ferment and then you melt it and it's wine. But because Melting it was implies fermented, that it's ice. I mean, you can melt plastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can melt anything if it's hot enough. I can melt you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't I don't know what it's made out of. Somehow they formed this into a cube and they said you keep it in your in your cabinet for a couple of weeks. It'll ferment and you got wine, but because it wasn't yet fermented, they were allowed to sell it technically. So there's like some of these workarounds that existed that people were exploiting. Sure, but it still wasn't enough. Um, so people got into moonshine moonshining. Yeah, uh, moonshine became very popular because obviously you could make it at home and you're not selling it. So technically speaking, it's legal for you to moonshine if you're only consuming for yourself. The yeah, second you sell moonshine, you're breaking the law, but if you're just eating it or drinking it yourself legal. I have a fun. lot of friends who yeah. I give it to and they pay me rent and they donate s- they donate to me. I'm a, I'm a priest, priest. <laughs> and, and they give, they to, give the to the church and, and at church right now we meet at the schoolhouse. Yeah. It's a mobile church. It's a mobile church and eventually and we're going to save it for our own building. That's why they're giving me money. Yes, 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 and we're taking communion with moonshine with moonshine. Yes, yes, yes. It's uh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. It's moonshine and movement for the Lord. That's what we're doing. We're a trendy church. <laughs> Can you say that word again? Trendy. We've never heard that before. <laughs> Why does he talk like that? <laughs> we're a trendy church because he's sketchy and he's trying to get away with it. <laughs> and so moonshiners became popular and uh, the United States government was in a a bit of a predicament with this. This amendment is the 18th amendment that passed sure. to allow prohibition. Um, and there was a lot of political pressure to pass this law. Um, it kind of became the point where it was like so much of the popular vote was going to go in favor of this, that if you wanted to be elected president, you had to be on the prohibition side, whether right. you really were or not. And so that's kind of how it happened. Uh, but the, they didn't have the budget anywhere to create a force to enforce this. Um, and so okay. they, the police, obviously, they wanted to continue being police. And occasionally, they would get involved in prohibition stuff. But they put together a prohibition force. And this was an underfunded, very small 
kind of police force that was put together to go around and see if anybody was drunk and take him to jail if they were <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and to see if anybody was selling liquor and stuff like that. Sure, but they were underfunded didn't make a didn't have enough money to do what they were trying to do. And so what it what really happened is it was a situation where they could not possibly enforce this law. Um, right. they, they just they did not have the numbers to keep up with this uh, and it very quickly became something where the general public realized oh we can just get away with this. Yeah. Am I going to get caught? Most likely not. Is somebody going to get caught? Probably, but am I going to get caught? It's like oh, me with street parking. Yeah, I'm like, I, what are the odds? What are the odds that I'm the one that gets towed? <laughs> it's kind of like I heard is someone, somebody going to get towed. Yeah, but they deserve it. I was listening to a podcast. Someone ex, uh, described it like Napster or LimeWire. It's like, yeah, technically we're stealing music. Sure, but am I going to be the one that gets in trouble for this? Some people did. <laughs> Some people got an example made out of them. Yeah, but is it going to happen me? to me is nothing. I mean, yeah, my parents computer is <laughs> destroyed. <just toast. laughs> I'm jamming to rely on K while yeah. they're searching on forums online. How do I remove virus? <laughs> I'm also responding <laughs> to, to the their, <laughs> their questions. <laughs> I'm upstairs on my computer. <laughs> Responding. Some Subway kid, King says. <laughs> Subway King says. There's nothing you can do about it. Let your son download more music. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> There's some kid in Mississippi who's running up a tab on eBay with their credit card. And <laughs> oh man, my mom was an eBay fiend. One time she bought a pair of shorts for me on eBay. And I don't know if you know this about me when I was in eighth grade. Yeah. Um, but I was the size of a grown man, <laughs> so these are grown up shorts. Yeah, and so I put them on, uh, and I went to school uh, as, as you do with <laughs> my shorts on. But in my pocket was a fifty dollar bill. Oh, from some grown up that they left in the they left in the pocket the of, the, of the eBay Ooh, shorts. That's, thing. Wow. Yeah, what and you know what well, my mom did was what? she taught me a valuable life lesson. What? And she sent that money back to that person. Did she really? Yeah. Narc. Lame. <laughs> what? Yeah. That is insane. And she did this whole like, you, you know, to, we got to do the right thing. We got to send this back. And like, I, I, I wrote on the envelope and we sent it back. Wow. And uh, you know how much power you had in eighth grade with a $50 bill, dude. You know how much power I'm going to have when we're touring her retirement facilities <laughs> with a $50 bill. <laughs> Here's your budget, mom. <laughs> Should have let me keep it. We're going to do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. If I had invested that $50 too much money <laughs> that in 2007. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> prohibition became kind of the unenforceable. She did give me a block of what was not wine yet. <laughs> not yet <laughs> wine. She, she said, "When you graduate high school, you can." It was kind of like those Disney towels where you like you throw it in the bathtub and then it's a towel, but before you throw it in the oh, bathtub, it's sure. like a dice. <laughs> yeah, it's those <laughs> same thing. Throw it in the tub and you've got wine. <laughs> um. No, so, so this was like an unenforceable crime at this point. Okay, um, and there was a decent chunk of the population that was like, "Oh, we're not going to do this," because they were the ones that campaigned for it. Right, um, but there was a larger chunk that was like, "You think I'm going to stop drinking?" Uh, and they so, didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> the news hadn't hit them yet. They're still in the saloon. Still, what drunk. happened? They got so drunk before the saloons been closed the for two weeks. <laughs> 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 yeah, drunk people do that thing with their mouth. I used to be an Uber driver. I hung out with a lot of drunk people. <laughs> you didn't hang out. They paid you to drive them somewhere. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. So the first time was I drove these this group of girls. Yeah, I was single at the time, and uh, okay, I'm just. Saying okay, yeah, because you could have let them in your car if you were yeah <laughs> the, per the Billy Graham, the Billy Graham rule. rule. No, I was you know I I was uh, flirting yeah with the yeah, girl yeah, in the, right. the front seat. There's three of them in the back seat. They're all 
you know, we're I'm dropping them off. They're having a night. And uh, the girl in the front seat goes, uh, "Do you smoke weed?" And yeah. I was like, "No." <laughs> Uh -uh. Um, it's like not my Why'd vibe. Why'd you laugh at me? Sorry. Uh, I, was like, I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I was a youth pastor. <laughs> uh, don't do that. And uh, and she goes, well, do you want to come upstairs and hang out with us the rest of the night? Yeah. And I was like, ah, honestly, I really needed the money. So I was like, I got to keep driving. I'm sorry. And I didn't want to hang out with them. I don't know. I was, like, yeah. I was like, maybe I'll get her number, whatever. But as I'm talking to her, her friend leans up the middle seat and just goes, She's not going to make out with you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't initiate that. anything Thanks here for telling me. She's the one saying, will you she's hang out with me? The one. She is the one. She's, like, she's not going to make out with you. <laughs> okay. And I was like, all, <laughs> all right. right. Thanks for letting me know. And when she got out of the car, she was like, I would have. <laughs> 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 she didn't say that. She didn't say that. But uh, I just thought that was. Uh, I'm saying I've been around a lot of drunk people. One time, a guy. I think I told him <laughs> the podcast. Yeah, you. Uh, did I one. tell it? I think so. But the know. guy who I was driving him silent the whole time. Yeah. And then he just goes, "You gotta take a left here, but it's a one way street." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "I gotta turn right because it's a one way street. That's how it works." Mm -hmm. And he goes, "I'm gonna stab you in the neck." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, I was like, all right, you get out. I'm gonna call the police. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna stab you in the they neck. They showed up. They tased him. <laughs> I, they weren't gonna, but I yeah, asked them I to. Say, I said, "Will you tase him, please?" And they were like, and they were oh, like, well, they were yeah. like "What?" <laughs> I said, "Will you tase him?" And then he leaned out. It was a female cop. <laughs> he was a female guy. He he's passed out on the sidewalk. And she shows up, and I'm like, "Hey, will you tase him?" And he wakes up out of his dead drunk slumber and goes, "She's not gonna make out with you, dude. She's not gonna make out with you." And then she was like, "Yeah, I'll tase him." He's like, "Yeah, I'll tase him." <laughs> so that was better than getting made out with. I'll tell you she what. She was like, "One thing we do." Watching that guy get tased was <laughs> was just. It's the highlight of my year. Highlight of my year. <laughs> <laughs> this is my best man speech for years. <laughs> what does this have to do with this? <laughs> 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 this is my best man speech for years. What are you talking about? Every yeah, time I'm the best man, at someone's wedding. The best man at someone's wedding. You told that story. I have multiple people's best man. <laughs> I like that scenario. And every and every time I go, he's like, I don't oh care. man, I'm so <laughs> glad to be here for uh, <laughs> for my one of my best dearest friends. <laughs> this <laughs> night is almost as good as the night that I got to watch a female cop <laughs> chase. chase. A man who was threatened me. So drunk. Yeah. She did it three times. I felt so protected by her. <laughs> I felt so safe. I felt so safe in her arms. <laughs> and I hope that as you two go on this journey of marriage, that she will protect oh, you. Oh, there is a connection. Okay. The way that Officer oh, that's Danielle. Sweet. Oh, that's so cute. Danielle Weebles. Haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> protected me that night. Ah. And to remember this night, let's raise a toast of non-alcoholic drinks. <laughs> to the happy couple. And I'm going to have to taste them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the part of the wedding no one likes. Yeah. But everyone but it, sees it coming. Everybody knows. You got to taste the groom. The time has come. <laughs> to taste the groom. <laughs> to taste the groom. <laughs> In front of everyone in the room, <laughs> the piano starts to play the song. The doors open, and the dad walks down the aisle <laughs> with the taser, <laughs> and, and it's ejected. He's just Here carrying comes the, the taser. Here <laughs> comes like the taser. What kind of taser are you talking about, dude? You know that you shoot it, and the spikes oh. come out. He's holding the spikes. He's already shot it. <laughs> And it's like flopping around okay. on the ground. Yeah, that's a really long bit. We got, in. we got, we did an <laughs> audit, and we we learned that we should do less bits in our show to to, to maybe reach a broader audience. And, and I want here we are. And I don't think he's listening to more because we don't pay him to listen to more. <laughs> but if he is, I want him to know I didn't like that advice. <laughs> I liked the advice, but I can't stop. <laughs> this is a bitsy episode. <laughs> Okay, so the the law was an unenforceable law. Yeah, uh, and it 
and it just more and more ways to break this law started popping up. Sure. Uh, and then came uh, the most famous that also just started happening again a few years ago. Speakeasies. Speakeasies um, are cool. <clears throat> yeah, they just kind of popped up a few years I ago. I just like again. It's not even like a. It's a fun like secret. Yeah, secrets like, are fun. I want to open a yeah. It's a That's why the government society. keeps so many. It's just fun. <laughs> it's just fun, dude. <laughs> I want to get elected just to know the secrets. Hey, Mr. President, now that you've like passed the torch on to the next president, can you tell us any secrets or like why you guys keep so many secrets? From that the is public? actually why I think that uh, all this stuff. There's no actual government secrets. Have I told you this? Yeah, like, like we landed the moon. We did all the stuff that are not hiding too much, mm-hmm. right? Because I guarantee day one, he would have tweeted it. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, he, yeah. Yeah. Here's, he wasn't going to keep it. It is interesting, though. Like, it's like, eh. I mean, that might be. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little, that's a little, little much even for this podcast. <laughs> Maybe Thank we should you. talk about it in the after the fiddle. I don't want to. We'll talk about it in the after the fiddle. Uh, so speakeasies pop up, and yeah. speakeasies were a significant thing in American history. That a lot, a lot of them are in caves. Yeah, they're um, in caves. They're in basements. They're in uh, they're in fronts. So there's a shop that sells long gooses, but you pull one of the geese. What long gooses? Long geese. What long geese? Long gooses. I don't know what you're saying. All your lawn outside. Uh-huh. A goose sticking your lawn. Why is, there, why is there a store dedicated to long geese? Because it's a front. It's not. That's not what they're actually selling. They're just selling bogus products. And then you go to the. Why was that the example you used, though? Because <clears throat> there was one of them in my hometown. Um, There's a shop <laughs> that sells lawn geese. Yeah, we've talked about this. It was it, it was called Long Goose Designs. It was open for like 11 years, had a giant parking lot. Never saw a car in that parking lot, but it was open for like 11 years and it was always open and it I was worked there for a bit. They said you could take <laughs> as many geese as you wanted as long as it, as long as it was still in the conveyor kidding. belt. I just walked and just caught these lawn geese. <laughs> okay, so anyway, whatever. So a place that sells lawn geese, I yeah, guess and you walk up to the person at the at and they the and you just say a secret little code. Yeah, you say that was a speakeasy. Is that what you're saying? No, I think that was place? I think that was a CIA front, but <laughs> <laughs> but this one is a speakeasy. <laughs> you walk up, you say cockle doodle do, which was a weird phrase because that's not what geese do. Okay. Um, well, and that's then, how they throw you off. Yeah, they say you say cockle doodle do, and the you guy quack, grabs quack. They shoot you. <laughs> the guy grabs one of the geese, like it like strangles the geese, mm-hmm. and then the floor opens out from under you. Go down a slide, and then you fall in this room, and it's like, well, quit talking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can't tell too much about it, but I do like the. That's what I'm saying. I like the vibe. Yeah, they're like playing jazz. I and like, like a secretive vibe. There's like they, they have like the stage and it's like the classic like 20s showgirls. It's like very great Gatsby yeah. vibe in there. And My like, life's not exciting. I need some secrets. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's start some. Well, I mean, I've got I've got that one secret I've got that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so speakeasies became very, very popular. Sure. And what was interesting about speakeasies is this speakeasies themselves mm-hmm. rapidly changed the culture in America. Um, and I, and I, I, I don't know if anybody's made this connection and I don't know if I'm qualified to, but I'm going to, I really think that the speakeasy was what made the roaring twenties, the roaring twenties because it was for the first time really in American history was the, a lot of the cultural norms and uh, regulations around alcohol were stripped away because now it was illegal to do this do any anyways. Yeah. And so now it was like, well, there's no regulation. There's no regulation. We can just so there was no. <clears throat> yeah, you can overserve. There was no legal limit. There was no age minimum. There was no more cultural norm of you only drank with people of the same sex. Yeah. Um, and so now all of a sudden it was different. The vibe around sure. alcohol changed and it wasn't you didn't day drink. You didn't go drink after like yeah, it was secretive all of the guys. Yeah, it was a it was a party and it was a secretive party and it was like you were kind of it was a club. You're in or you're out. Um, you had to be in the know to get into it. Yeah, and and, and it was it's a lot like our Patreon supporters. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> use code cockadoodle do. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's definitely gonna be the text like, cockadoodle do. <laughs> <laughs> I get that that's I guarantee Daniel's gonna make that the Discord bot <laughs> signal. Cockadoodle do. Yeah. 
Hey, thanks for checking out this episode of Things I Learned Last Night. If you're here and you're a little shocked because you've been watching ASMR videos all night and you woke up to the sound of my laughter, uh, let me help you out real quick and join back in the ASMR. Uh, one thing that would help us a lot in the algorithm is if you left some comments or some reviews. If you're on the podcast app, we'd really appreciate that and it would help us uh, grow this show. So thanks for your support. Uh, but if not, uh, and <laughs> you're just here Jeez. trying to sleep, I hope I interrupted it. Uh, but here's another advertisement. It changed the culture around alcohol overnight um, yeah. because of the speakeasies because it was kind of it forced the hand on it. Sure. Um, and then uh, it, for the first couple of years, it was just stuff like this. And then a couple of years into it, something interesting happened. We can call that the criminal underworld um, because obviously something became illegal and that meant crime. They get to do it. Um, <laughs> If it's illegal, the criminals get to do it. Ah, finally, a new <laughs> enterprise to embark on <laughs> speakeasies. So the mafia was like, we sell alcohol now. <laughs> and so what they did is they found okay. rich people who had stockpiled alcohol, stole it all from them, started selling it. Is that what they did? Yeah. Or they would find shipments of like clergymen that were shipping all their alcohol. Um, different situations like that. Yeah, they'd rob it and they'd sell it. Um, and then they'd manufacture their own uh, alcohol and they'd sell it and it became a massive criminal enterprise and cities all over the nation like these mafias started these mafias and gangs started popping up uh, where their main export was alcohol okay. uh, and they were getting very rich off alcohol and at first for the first couple of years it was relatively peaceful they were except for the robberies the robberies were obviously not very peaceful yeah it sucked <clears throat> but the everything else they did they like kind of stayed out of each other's the everything business. else they did <laughs> <laughs> the the I, what I wish to say the mafias and the gangs respected each other. They stayed out of each other's business. Sure, but a couple of years into it, things started to grow. They started to realize they were competitors, and they're criminals already. So they just started killing each other and encroaching on each other's territory and gutting each other down in the streets. And it became very violent. Um, <laughs> I love how quickly he's just telling the whole history. <laughs> and I mean, eventually things got a little hairy. They started gunning each other down in the streets. Blood was flowing into the gutters, saying. <laughs> The streets were colored red for weeks. Um, you know, things got weird. So it, the government was like, well, we don't like that. You know, <laughs> there was a guy named George Remus. Um, and I'll show you a picture of George Remus. Please. George Remus was a prohibition officer. I like his, and his hat. His job was to uh, catch pro pro people who were breaking the prohibited. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and he realized really quickly um, that he was paid a little bit of money to do what he was doing and it was very dangerous and the mafia was just as dangerous. So he's the mafia making significantly more money played a double. Yeah, agent. and so he uh, he just straight up left the prohibition agency and he started. Uh, That's one of the first old timey photos you've shown me that looks like he could like this looks like he could be a 2023 year person. You know what I'm saying like in that outfit. Look at his face. He looks like uh, like a an insurance salesman guy. Yeah, I think what's interesting is, I mean, obviously his hat's kind of out of style. Right, right, but right. Like the suit is the suit's timeless, and his haircut is kind of coming back into style now. Right, is back in style. So like it, because that's the thing that I've always thought, or I've been thinking lately. We talk, we talk about generations. Have you seen this? Like people talk about how like every generation looks younger when they were young. Like so, if you look at teenagers in the 90s, they look older than teenagers now. Okay. And teenagers in the 80s look older than teenagers now. I disagree and with the that reason now. Teenagers now look <coughs> old, dude. You think so? I think there are people who are in their 20s who are on social media that I go, you are not in your 20s. There is that I did recently, very recently see a TikTok about that, but what I've seen a lot is like over the years, you go each decade, they yeah. look older than the current decade sure. teenagers. And I think the reason for that is just style. I think they have haircuts and clothing styles that a lot of that generation just carried into adulthood. And so we associate their style with old. We don't sure. associate the way they look with old. Um, that's my thought. But I did also see a TikTok, I think yesterday, about Gen Z looking older than millennials. And this guy was claiming it was because they're stressed, um, which maybe be less stressed. <laughs> Which yeah, just stop whining about it. Man, you know what? That sounds I like just, a spending problem. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, that sounds like you just gotta 
cut out Starbucks and cut out uh, get rid of the dog. toast and get rid of the dog. You can't afford the dog. Can't afford it. Yeah, get so, rid of the dog. You have. I know you love him, but kill him. Kill him. Kill the dog. <laughs> it'll teach you some life lessons. <laughs> yep, that'll get you there. Um, it'll so, undo the last fifty years of aggressive <laughs> politics that have put us in a situation <laughs> where you're no longer able to afford a home or make a livable income on a normal job, and so mm-hmm. now you got to work two incomes at least in your family household. And now yep. some of you got to have like two or three jobs each, you know. And so it'll undo all that if you just kill it's, that dog. It's the dog's fault. Kill the dog. Kill the dog. <laughs> I got that dog in me. <laughs> and don't let him touch your milk. <laughs> don't let that dog touch your milk. <laughs> George, George realized I'm not as rich as the mafia. Um, but, but I'd I like be. to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he learns all those tactics uh, and he starts robbing. Uh, <laughs> he just starts his own <laughs> side mafia. He starts his own mafia. Okay. And so he starts robbing these. Yeah, how do you start a mafia? Well, I mean, that's what I was actually, you know what I was thinking was uh, because I'm watching Fargo mm-hmm. and uh, this one's in the set in the 1950s where the Italian mob is in Kansas City and like you got your higher ups obviously, yeah. yeah, but how is everyone else just there? I you think know? they get roped in like I think they're part of the family. A lot of them are part of the family like because they have big families. Sure, so they're part of that extended family and they're just kind of stuck, but I, I mean some like people get think- like blackmailed into it like oh, they get sure. stuck. Because they get, they see something, or they are like, or they're just trying to make some quick time. money. Yeah, and like they get they, in, and there's now they know too they much. There's no debt. way out. They get a gambling debt. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they take a loan from the mafia, and it's like, oh, I guess that's what I was trying to figure out. I was like, yeah. why would you be one of the henchmen? Yeah, I think a lot of people don't. I do think there's probably some people who are like, yeah, I'm gonna work my way up the ladder. Why are you my henchman? <laughs> <laughs> well, I took a loan from you, and I'm paying off my debt. Shut your mouth. <laughs> No, George. So George you were supposed to be funny about it. Not real. <laughs> so George, he with $20 to his name and just the clothes on his back. He <laughs> robbed his first transport with $50 in my eBay shorts <laughs> and a small loan of a million dollars. <laughs> a small loan of a million dollars. <laughs> I robbed that train starts his mafia empire. No, he uh, was a little smarter than most mafia men. And so what he did was he uh, he got together a group of um, of henchmen and he uh, purchased from another mafia a bunch of uh, liquor as a clergyman. And so okay. it was like legal alcohol. And so he had his legal clergy alcohol and then he transported that to where he was going to use that alcohol. And then he had a group of his hired henchmen that robbed that train and stole the alcohol. Okay, so, so he could report it as a loss. So it was a loss. So legally, he was clean. Yeah, but he had this downstream that robbed that and then the downstream was selling that illegally, but he was he was off the books on it. So he was fair and so he was successful doing this for a few years um, and eventually the prohibition agents like followed the trail and were able to link it all back to him and so he goes to jail this at this point. He's a multimillionaire very very wealthy sure um, massive house um, in uh, well, yeah, because all the other prohibition uh, abolitionists, whatever they were, <laughs> prohibition agents. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they were prohibition. Yes, not anti. They were pro prohibition. Okay. <laughs> anyway, they were all the other agents. Yes. Were like, why don't we have big houses? Yes. That's where you get a lot of them got dirty and corrupt. Sure. And a lot of them were taking like bribes and under the table money to. Just turn a blind eye to stuff. Sure, a lot of them got blackmailed by the mafia too. Um, but uh, George got caught. George went to jail. George had a massive house in Chicago, very rich. Um, and he told his wife when he went to jail, he got like a two-year sentence. He's like, he's like, look after my stuff. I'll be back in two years. And she said, okay. And so she sold everything he owned and ran off with another man. Uh, <laughs> Can't trust him. <laughs> and so he gets released from jail. And this is this is a different time. So he has no idea. He serves a sentence, gets released from jail, comes back to his house, and it's empty. And she's not there. And so he realizes what happened, obviously. And he's furious. And so some time passes. And one day he's riding in a cab and he sees in another vehicle his wife with another man. She didn't go far enough away. <laughs> Same town. <laughs> That's so dumb. So he sees her and he uh, uh, he tells the cab driver to run her off the road. The cab driver's like, okay. And so the cab driver's <laughs> 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 cab driver like, 
All right. <laughs> so the cab driver runs her car off the road and like they crash. He gets out and she's like, she gets out of the car and he shoots her in the head right there in the street. And uh, obviously gets arrested, goes to trial. And in the trial, he was a lawyer before he got into being a prohibition agent. Okay. So he represents himself. And in his representation, he pleads insanity. So throughout his representation, he starts. He starts being like, ah. He starts asking all these crazy questions. He starts going between sobbing and like all this different stuff. And he paints this story of he got in trouble. He went to jail. He served his time. He's a reformed man. His so wife he's stole pleading from him. insanity on behalf of himself. Yes. Your Honor, my client's insane. <laughs> That's right. I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm so crazy. I'm a crazy guy. <laughs> I'm a crazy man. He's a crazy man. He's a crazy. Can't you tell this guy's crazy? <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> and then he like he like slithers across the bench. <laughs> Can't you tell this man's crazy? He's <laughs> <laughs> watching like. Okay. <laughs> this is pretty crazy of you. <laughs> and so, uh, and he paints the stop story of. He gets in trouble. He does. He does get in trouble. He serves his time, and right. he's a reformed man. He comes out of jail, and during that time, his wife leaves him. His she takes his fortune. She runs off with another man, right. and it put him into a dark place. And now he's an insane man, broken. And he saw her, and he shot her, and that. But that was that was really. It's on the cab driver. That was a <laughs> that was a a part of his ins- insanity, and he does such a good job at defending himself that the jury deliberates for nineteen minutes. <laughs> and they come back and they say not guilty and he no walks way! completely free of any any like repercussions of the crime uh, walks free and this made national People headlines the past <laughs> were so <laughs> gullible this makes national headlines and the majority of people do side with Remus thinking his wife was the one in the wrong um, and so this was people hated women so much. This was this was a huge deal. Um, around the same time, we that's have, crazy. Around the same time, we have the legendary Al Capone, uh, who we've all heard of. He is a mafia man who? Uh, known as Scarface because he had a scar on his face as a child. Um, which actually, that was not the nickname he liked. He did not like the nickname Scarface, and he did not want that to stick. <laughs> he and I, this is not a joke. He preferred Snorky. And he kept trying to make Snorky no, stick. S- snorky. <laughs> hey, Scarface. Snorky. Call me Snorky. <laughs> Are you sure, sir? I Are think you, Scarface instills a little bit Scarface more. Scarface is fear much more terrifying than Snorky. Snorky, haha. <laughs> and I guess we'll call you that. I guess we can call you Snorky if you want. All right. Snork, Snork. Uh, he quickly became like the top dog in Chicago. Yeah, incredibly wealthy. We don't know exactly how much he made because I'm rich enough. You, I mean, at a certain point, you can choose your own nickname. I guess. <laughs> call me Snorky. <laughs> call me Snorky. <laughs> Nobody called him Snorky. Everyone called him Scarface. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he went by Snorky. Incredibly <clears throat> brutal criminal. Um, ridiculous amount of murders. Ridiculous amount of money. Um, and it was a strange thing because. Everybody knew he I was mean, imagine Snorky's just imagine. Let's say yeah that the series went a little different. Yeah. And at the end of it, he's standing in the desert <laughs> and he says, say my name. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I know who you are. Say it. Say my name he goes, you're Snorky. <laughs> It's so stupid. <laughs> it is dumb. It is dumb. Yeah. Heisenberg is it's cool. Yeah, Snorky. <laughs> Not Snorky is only a letter away from Snooky. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why she chose it. Maybe she wanted to be like Al Capone. She is the head of the mafia in New Jersey. <laughs> That'd so be wild. Al Capone. Al Capone's incredibly wealthy. And what's strange is he is leading an insane criminal en- enterprise right. where they're killing people left and right. Sure. And blood is soaking the streets quite literally from directly from right. the work of Al Capone. But Al Capone was also a <laughs> like cherished public figure. Um, he would 
he would walk in to Wrigley Stadium. Standing ovations. And yeah, and he would sign autographs. People would be looking for his autograph and he'd be signing autographs. He would he would be Santa at the mall every year and kids would sit on his no. lap. And he, yes. Yeah, he would dress no. up as Santa every year. Like he was he was a part of like the local community. He was a staple in the community. He was that guy in Chicago, but he was also that guy, that guy <laughs> in Chicago and it's do you think it was an aberration of fear? Um, I think it might have been a little of both because I do think I think a lot of people knew, but I do think there was probably a lot of people who were just like, yeah, it's the local rich guy who just does a lot for the, the community. local rich guy. Yeah, and people are like, I don't really know why he's rich. I hear he dumps a lot of stuff in the river. I hear, like I, Christmas bodies. one year, he <laughs> got visited by the ghost of Christmas <laughs> past or something. And he was like, whoa, people in the past were really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know? Yeah, and then the ghost of Christmas past told him they're just as dumb today. And you he's can like, kill anyone you want and get away with right. it. And he was right. like, he's like, okay, good. <laughs> hey, Merry Christmas, Snorky. And so this is an interesting time because the it's the late 1920s mm-hmm. and the perception of prohibition is changing, particularly a, among the temperance people. All the people who campaigned for it early on, the Christ, the conservative Christians were like, hey, turns out this is way worse. People are significantly drunker. Yeah. Little kids are drinking. Women and men are drinking together. There are there's blood in the streets. People are getting <laughs> each other down all the time. Blood in the like, streets. <laughs> crime is worse, and it was objectively crime was objectively worse. Yeah, and a lot of people lost their jobs. Like that was kind of one thing that was an oversight. Is like overnight salon saloons bars, uh, yeah. uh, liquor stores, all the companies that manufactured alcohol like shut either down. shut down or had to cut cut the majority of the staff because now they're just manufacturing for clergy basically right um, and so it was a massive hit to the economy because alcohol was a big part of the economy um, and so it caused a lot of damage um, that I think a lot of people didn't foresee at the time right and so the conservative Christians changed their mind and they were like this is bad and so they started campaigning for alcohol to come back They're like you guys drink more. <laughs> We still won't. We still won't, but it should at least be legal because this is bad. This is not going well. Yeah. And so the campaigns started up again and they started campaigning for it and picketing for it. And then uh, uh, members of the community that were like not the conservative Christians, but they wanted alcohol to be legal again, started campaigning as well. Sure. Um, and this led to one of my favorite photos of all time. Um, this uh, we uh, want beer. Yeah, this this picket line and all the signs just say we want beer. 1933, which is incredible. Um, and these are the same women that were campaigning for it to be illegal in the first yeah. place with all the signs that say liquor that touches these lips lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours are now. I mean, look we at want I mean, look at the you know, the lady down front. This yeah, one right here. Yeah. Well, I think that's Carrie. Is it really go back? It looks a lot like Carrie. Oh, yeah, it might be, but now they're they're campaigning for prohibition to get overturned and uh, and it's making progress, but at this point, it's an amendment, 18th Amendment, and that's right. hard to get that undone. Um, well, luckily, Al Capone, uh, he kind of fired the nail in the coffin, as it were, uh, because one day uh, he arranged a deal with a local Irish moth mafia and had a group of them come meet a group of his mafia men uh, for a trade of alcohol and so they were going to buy a bunch of alcohol and they were going to sell it and whatever, you know, pretty typical thing that the mafia would do. Uh, and so seven or eight of them showed up and uh, Al Capone's mobsters were there and they were all dressed like cops and they told all the, the Irish mob to line up against the wall and they just gunned them down. And this was known as the Valentine's Day massacre. Yeah, it's on Valentine's Day. This event was kind of the nail in the coffin where everyone was like, oh, yeah, this is Snorky's bad. This is out of hand. This is getting out of hand. Snorky's um, being bad in public right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Snorky gets arrested. He gets sent to uh, uh, San Francisco. Uh, what's that? Island Alcatraz? Called? Alcatraz. Thank you. He gets sent to Alcatraz um, Snorky <laughs> and then uh, well, I'm, I mean, that's what he prefers to go by. Yeah, it's, it's it says it on his, his little vest snorky. <laughs> he walks into the jail and everyone's like, his vest? Hey, snorky. <laughs> is he working at Home Depot? Or it's got written on there. My name is. <laughs> My name is what do you mean? It's written on his, <laughs> his, little, jail, his little jail vest. Oh, okay. 
a shirt. I don't know what do you want me to call it. It's a prison. It's like prison Smirky robes. was not the right name for me here. <laughs> yeah, I should have gone by Scarface. Face. I would have so much Scarface more respect. Way better. <laughs> uh, and so he goes to prison, and then a couple of years later, in 1933, they repeal prohibition, um, and it it was like the liberation of France. Parties in the streets, bars yeah. open back up, people are drinking, um, and the world was never the same because. Like I said, the speakeasies changed the culture around al- alcohol. Yeah, um, and so people actually, I- ironically, drank a lot less after Prohibition. Um, they still drank, but they drank a lot less. And there was um, uh, people people uh, paced themselves, and people would drink in mixed company. Right, um, and then regulations came that add added minimum drinking ages and things like that. Um, and so a lot of people learned that in that Prohibition, like wow. Um, uh, uh, it sounded like, hey, if it's illegal, then that's better. Sure. It being illegal In made practice, it possible for yeah. all the cultural norms to go away, all the other regulations to go away, and right. for it to crush the economy and create a whole new criminal underground um, that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So they realized that um, while it seemed good, prohibition actually wasn't the way to go. Regulation was the way to go. And so it became a much more heavily regulated industry than it was in the past and and the culture uh, shifted it. And so I think uh, honestly, I'm curious and I don't know if this for sure, but I'm curious if that did have an impact on the way the campaign against cigarettes went because I, I think they could have campaigned to just outlaw them altogether. Yeah, and instead they were like we want every box to say this causes cancer. Yeah, and we want every kid to think that you look stupid if you're smoking a cigarette. Looks so dumb. Yeah, and for the most part it worked. Um, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think people who smoke look stupid. Yeah, it is kind of. I don't know. Yeah, the cultural, the culture has changed. It used to be like in the nineties, it was kind of cool. It was like, oh, you're you smoke? That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in That's pretty cool. By the time we were in high school, it's like, oh, you smoke? What? What? Gross. That's pretty lame. You smell. You smell bad. <laughs> you smell no gross. one's gonna want to kiss your lips. <laughs> yeah. Lips that She's touch. She's not going to make out with you, dude. <laughs> She's not going to make out with you. Uh, yeah, so that's prohibition. Um, honestly, the main reason I brought this up is for Carrie Nation. She's my new hero. Uh, you should go for her as Halloween <laughs> on Halloween. <laughs> Long live Carrie Nation. Uh, smash, smash, smash. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm so fascinated by Al Capone's name being Snorky. <laughs> Snorky. You that know what his, l- his cellmate's name at Alcatraz was? What? The Fiddler. The fiddler. Which is also cooler than Snorky. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching this episode of Things I Learned Last Night. If you like this and you want more of our show, please check out other episodes. One of my favorites is Michael Fagan, a guy who snuck into Buckingham Palace. It was kind of like his little drunk trick that he would do. Uh, And one time he actually met the queen. It's a really fun story. Uh, We have a lot of great bits in it. If you like our show and you want us to keep doing more of it, please subscribe, uh, follow us on Spotify, on your podcast app, leave a comment, whatever you can do. It really does help uh, to make the show go further. So thank you so much for being here.